spent trying to find activities that her husband can do and can do successfully that don't cause frustration. Um, anybody else willing to share what they hope to get out of this evening? Yeah. I think with our mom, I think we're trying to see if we can find any activities to keep her busy during the day okay. so that she's not sitting home doing nothing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that someone's not sitting home doing nothing, trying to find more activities for them to do during the day. That's great. Yes, um, for my wife, uh, it's, it's really an issue for me of seeing her more productively engaged in a way that gives her a sense of accomplishment and, and uh, feeling like she's, you know, a, a, a feeling of satisfaction in Great. what she's doing during the day. Absolutely, that's wonderful. So activities to have this feelings of feeling of satisfaction, feel accomplished, feel like we're doing something productive. Wonderful, thank you. Yes. Um, my husband recently moved into a memory care facility, and while he was at home, we did a pretty good job of coming up with activities. He's kind of with him leading, but okay. were meaningful and productive for him, and uh, kind of turned everything into that. But since he's moved, it's been hard to keep those up, and the facility doesn't have as many hand-type activities. Okay for people who are as nonverbal as he is. So okay. I'm hoping to learn some things that I can do when I visit. <laughs> okay, great. So different activities for when you visit and also looking for more ideas for different tactile, tactile or, or objects as opposed to just kind of passive listening activities. Okay, great. Thank you. Anybody else want to share? Okay. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Okay. So how many of you are um, spouses of somebody with dementia? Okay, and then how about adult children? Grandchildren? Anybody who I didn't talk about, friends? Okay. All right, so most of you are spouses or adult children, just so that I have a sense of who I'm talking to. That sounds good. Okay, so today we're gonna talk through a couple of things. If I do not touch on the things that you hope to get from today by the end of my presentation, please feel free to stick around for a couple extra minutes. I would love to talk to you or remind me at the end and we can talk about it as a group. Okay, objectives. So I'm hoping by the end of today, you'll be able to describe the benefits of activity engagement. I'm also hoping that you'll have more ideas of different methods to enhance engagement and apply these techniques for an activity adaptation to your real life. So you have a couple things in front of you today. One is a copy of the PowerPoint. So you can feel free to take notes, that's for you to keep. The other is just kind of a little cheat sheet, if you will, with some general strategies. And on the back is a little activity. So if anyone has to potentially leave early today, the back of that one sheet of paper, you can try to almost fill that out as you go. If you can stay for the whole time, I'm gonna guide you through that towards the end of the presentation. Okay, so now we're just going to talk through a little bit of background on activity engagement. So why is this topic important? So informal caregivers, that would be everyone in this room, you are providing the majority of the hands-on care to people with dementia. Um, we know that most people are cared for in their homes and challenging behaviors, so things like repeating, agitation, aggression, wandering, rummaging, things of that nature they are reported to be the most challenging aspect of care from caregivers. And we know that activity engagement is one method of decreasing a lot of those behaviors. So there are a lot of different benefits to activity engagement, one of which is it can decrease challenging behaviors in dementia. Additional benefits, we wanna know that um, we are doing everything we can to decrease risk for depression. So people with dementia are at a higher risk for depression. Activity engagement can decrease that risk. So one other reason we want to increase engagement. Um, it's also important because pharmacologic approaches, so medic medications, they can actually um, potentially have some side effects and they also don't cover every single behavior that's out there. So we do have um, our other approach, a non-pharmacologic approach, which is activity engagement and task adaptation. We also know that if we can find appropriate activities, it's going to reduce caregiver time spent on duty. So if we can find those activities and if it's appropriate for that person, we can almost do a setup type of a thing. So you can set up an activity, allow that caregiver to walk away for a few moments, 
then you're not on duty for every single minute of the day. Does that make sense? Okay. And then a few additional pieces. So it provides a sense of purpose. So kind of what you were speaking about earlier. Activity engagement is important because it gives people a sense of purpose. We want activities to capitalize on those lifelong social roles and interests. So the reason that I don't just come in and tell families, these are the exact activities that you need to do with your family member. It has to be client specific. We have to think about what was important to that person. What was their type of work? What were their leisure activities prior to dementia? And how can we take those activities and adapt them in a way that's going to allow them to be successful, but it's still meaningful for them? This is actually one of my favorite points. We all, as humans, have an innate desire to participate. We all want to participate in the world. So I say in meaningful occupation, as an occupational therapist, we call occupation any activity you do during your day. So um, anything that's meaningful to you, any meaningful activity, we all as humans have an innate desire to do that. So that does not go away just because someone has dementia. So that's why we want to try to adapt these things so that people can participate. So what changed? So I just have a few examples of different things that caregivers have shared with me over the years. Um, they might say something like, well, my husband used to wash the dishes, but he just doesn't do it anymore. <coughs> or she tells me she wants to do a puzzle, but she never does. He used to read the newspaper, now he glances it and puts it down, or this is a big one. Every time I ask if she wants to do something with me, this says craft, she says no. So do these types of things sound familiar for some of your family members? So what do you guys think changed? What is it that changed with the person with dementia that, that um, these things are now issues? The will to do. The will to do. So they might still have some desire, but the ability to start that task is really hard, right? Good. How about anything else? Well, the, the brain's changed. Right. The brain is changing. Yeah. So different things like starting, or I call it initiation, also sequencing. So being able to um, problem solve through multiple steps or to do multiple steps in a row, that can become really challenging. Because of these brain changes, the task itself is now too complex possibly too complex. Um, so it's important for us to understand how to choose activities, but also even more important, how to adapt the activities so that we can meet that person's needs. So we're going to spend is, a while. Is there yeah. anything other than just sort of trying it out to find out if it's a test that has become too complex for the person, or is there some way of knowing that in advance so you don't make for frustration all around? That's a really good question. So um, the question is about, is there any way to know prior to trying an activity if it's too complex? A lot of it honestly is trial and error. I am going to share with you, I added at the last minute, so it's not in your PowerPoint, a, a cognitive model that I use that kind of helps me based on observation of other day-to-day -day activities, know how to generalize those um, task adaptations to other activities, if that makes sense. So hold that thought for a couple more slides, and if I don't address it, bring it back up. Does that sound okay? I'm going to bring up something called the Allen's Cognitive Disabilities Model, and I'm hoping that I'm going to touch on your point. That's a very, very good question. Um, we're going to talk now about how to choose activities. So that's where at the end of this I have something about a, dis a cognitive disabilities model that might help us a little bit with that, but we also want to think about what's important to that person. So I was saying earlier, we want to make sure we're picking activities that capitalize on those lifelong social roles. So we want to th pick things that are important to that person. When we're picking activities, really important, the purpose is the process. It's not about the end product. Okay, so if we choose something like folding laundry, Let's say that that was something that um, my grandmother always used to love to do, so we decide that that's a great activity for her to do now. For me, the end goal is not are the towels folded, or are they folded right, are they folded well, that doesn't matter. The purpose is the process. It's did she engage in the task, was she enjoying herself in the process. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Really important point. 
Um, and then we also want to think about safety and things that are repetitive and familiar are going to be the most effective. We want to try to fit the activity into a person's established routine, meaning if we have downtime, you know, after lunch for a few hours most days, that's when we're going to try a new activity. We're not going to completely shift someone's routine just to fit activity engagement in. We want to try to work it into the routine. Any questions about anything so far? Just flag me down if you have questions. Okay, we're also going to talk about setup activities versus ones that require constant assistance. So again, I'm going to talk about cognitive levels in a few moments. Not every person with a dementia is able to engage in a setup activity. Some people do require constant assistance. However, there are some people who we can find an activity that allows them to engage for at least a few minutes that we can walk away. When we walk away, I call that a setup activity, meaning we can set the person up and give us a few moments. Um, we also want to think about physical abilities of the person with dementia. So fine motor control and coordination, visual perceptual skills, strength and balance. We don't want to choose activities that require significant strength or significant balance if that's really impaired. We don't want to choose activities that are really complex in terms of the visual skills that are needed if the person doesn't have really great vision. Or something, I'm not going to ask someone to you know, do a lot of lacing or threading of a needle if their fine motor coordination is impaired. Does that all make sense? Okay. Just laying a lot of the groundwork for choosing activities. All right. So again, this slide is not in your packet. I just added this at the last minute. Um, this is a model that's specific to occupational therapy. I find it really, really helpful, so I thought I would share it with all of you. I think it could potentially help when choosing activities, so I figured it was worth, worth throwing out there. So we have this um, model that has six different levels. So a level six would be all of us on a really good day meaning we're not stressed out, we're not tired, we're feeling pretty good, we're going to be up here in a level six. It's what we call planned actions. Um, we can do things that are fairly complex. We can manage our finances. We could plan a complex dinner party, right? We could host a lot of people for dinner and we can figure out how many different sides we need and the entree and figure out the right amount of ingredients and the timing for all the different dishes. Those are pretty complex tasks. All of us on a good day are going to be able to do those things. Then we get into a level five. That's what we call exploratory actions. These clients are more around a mild cognitive impairment stage. So they might need a little bit of assistance with certain tasks, um, but can still perform many activities with only mild help. So visual cues, maybe minor verbal cues. Then I want to talk mostly about these two, two stages, excuse me. I will say that probably at least 80% of the clients that I work with fall into either level four or level three. Some of my clients fall into level two, once in a while level five. So level four and level three, we're gonna differentiate these two a little bit. So we're talking about goal-directed actions versus manual actions. So if I use the example of someone who's brushing their teeth, someone at a level five, this isn't even a concern, right? If it's time for them to brush their teeth, they're going to be able to brush their teeth. When we get to a level four, goal-directed actions, somebody um, who falls into this category, we might need to help them out a little bit. So maybe we're gonna clear the sink off, leave out only the toothpaste and the toothbrush. Um, but if we say time to brush your teeth, they're going to put the toothpaste on the toothbrush, they're gonna start to brush their teeth, they're gonna brush all parts of their teeth, and when they're finished and their teeth are clean, they're going to stop brushing. When we get to level three, these clients are going to engage in the activity, but in a different way. So they're not goal directed. Goal is my teeth need to be clean, I need to brush my teeth. Once that goal is completed, I'm finished. When we're in a level three, these clients are going to, well, we're probably going to put the toothpaste on their toothbrush, might give them that cue to put it in their mouth, and then they're gonna brush. But they're probably just gonna keep brushing that same spot for a while. And then we might cue them, okay, other side and they might brush that side for a while, but they might not stop until we say, okay, you're good, teeth are clean. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Or if any of you are comfortable sharing, 
Do any of you think that your family members might fall into one of these stages? Possibly? Okay. Okay. So um, that tells us a little bit about how we're going to set up activities. Another example would be bathing. So these clients, we could give them, I say clients, I'm sorry, your family members. Um, we can give them a washcloth with soap on it, and they're going to be able to wash most parts of their body until they're clean. Somebody who falls into this level three, they might wash their arm and just kind of keep washing their arm. And then maybe we cue them to wash their other arm and they keep washing their other arm. They're not going to wash their back because they can't see it. They're probably not going to wash their legs because they're not thinking about them. So they're going to engage in a really repetitive way, but not with this specific goal in mind. Um, and then we have postural actions. So these clients are definitely more um, sensory oriented. So they're going to engage by picking things up and feeling them, touching them, and putting them back down. Um, so very sensory oriented. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. And then automatic actions. Um, these are my clients who are really just responding to painful stimuli. So this is really the progression. Um, this to me is helpful if we're kind of observing self-care tasks. And we see how our family member is engaging. That's going to tell us how we can take those components of the task and generalize it into leisure engagement activities. <coughs> so for example, if we are trying to choose a puzzle, let's say puzzle, right? Goal-directed activity would be a small puzzle. Someone can engage in that puzzle and complete it because they're goal-directed. Manual actions, somebody can do something in a repetitive manner. So we might have to say, okay, put that piece here. And they can connect those two pieces. <coughs> but we're gonna cue them to be able to connect them. Somebody at a level two, they're gonna pick up the piece and feel it and touch it, and then they're gonna put it back down on the table. And those are going to be our expectations of what each person can do at each stage. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Is that helpful? Yeah. Kind of, okay, yeah. Uh, in my experience, uh, there is key, those, those categories. Um, sometimes uh, my husband is suddenly in a different category. Occasionally, but I assume you mean when you talk about that, you're talking about generally the person behaves in a certain way, right? Right, okay. absolutely. Absolutely. And truthfully, each of these stages has kind of modes within them. This is kind of a general way of looking at it. And we can kind of say like sometimes people fall into a high three or a low four. So people can kind of fluctuate very close or, or show components of each stage. Um, I'm more, more was talking about it in a general sense just for, so we can kind of pull some of those strategies and generalize them. Thank you for sharing that though, that's important. And were you gonna say something too? Sort of the same thing yeah. that, that <clears throat> level three can be most of the time and then suddenly we, we instead of placing the piece, we start eating it. Okay. That, you know, that, right. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. So kind of going from three most of the time, mm -hmm. sometimes two, two and two. then being redirected, and then right. you know placing the chew up. Absolutely. Piece. That's a really good point, and I think a big part of that too, um, kind of some of those fluctuations are based on task setup and environment. Not all the time, but sometimes. So we're going to talk about some of those points too. I think that's a really good point. Were you going to say so something? No, you answered my question. Oh, okay. Environment was my question. Uh, absolutely. Environment plays a huge role in activity <laughs> engagement. So we're definitely going to touch on that today, too. All right. And does this answer your question a little bit about how we're going to know if a task is going to be too complex? Um, somewhat. Uh, can, I, can I give you a specific example? Please do. Absolutely. happened just last night. Okay. So, so uh, my wife takes her takes medications in the morning and at night. Okay. And uh, we, I've set up, at first she was sorting them out. I mean, she sort of, I guess it, the word is not progress, but uh, degressed, uh, if that's a word. So at first she was able to manage her own medications. Okay. And take them out of the, 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 the bottles and put them into the, the pill dispenser. Okay. Uh, and then she reached the point where she was no longer able to do that. So I was starting to do that. Okay. Uh, but but she was able to. Um, I, I there was a point between them when I actually wrote on the pill dispenser. So in the morning, here are the things that you take, and she was able to put them in there. Okay. Um, and then it reached the point where 
I would just do it, and, and she would come and bring them, and, and we would sort of review together what is today and what what are the, what which which cabinet <laughs> or which which uh, little box which box yeah <laughs> I today, know what you mean yeah this morning okay last night um, we had a really difficult time okay because she was confused about whether um, she should be taking the one that was in the compartment or she should be getting the pills for herself from each of the bottles okay. and taking them. So um, I, you know, it was, it became kind of difficult. And so I, I, I thought, well, having the names of the pills out there is, is confusing her. So I took the little label off and that got her really upset. Okay, uh, okay. And, and she said, well, you're doing this, now you have to know what I'm going to take. And, okay. and I was trying to explain, well, you really, all you really need to remember is to take the ones for Wednesday night. Right, right. Uh, but, but she just couldn't understand that, and I couldn't like. get her to understand that. Okay, and okay. And so it became very frustrating for both of us. So, Absolutely. Uh, so I'm I guess, sure. you know, I'm not exactly sure where Sure how this that. applies. Um, that's, a, that's a good point. So um, in terms of asking if how we would know if something's now too complex, I guess my my original thought was taking kind of the ADLs, meaning like bathing, dressing, grooming, and our observation based on those things, and translating it into leisure engagement activities. But this really is we would consider medication management an IADL, um, instrumental activity of daily living. So there's really not a whole lot we could do to generalize. It really is kind of that trial and error process. I wish I could say more to that, but we really can't anticipate exactly when someone will have that change um, in their cognitive function. So you're doing the best you can, you know, you notice that there's a change and you're attempting to adapt, which is the best that any of us can do, right? A lot of trial and error, and now you know for tonight um, that what you tried last night maybe wasn't effective, but now you can try a slightly different strategy and see if there's something else that allows her to still feel in control but without um, creating any additional frustration or agitation. But yeah, that's a good point. I'm going to try to share some different strategies throughout today about how you can adapt different tasks, which I'm hoping might help you out with that. Um, and if not, I know next time I'm here, we're gonna talk more about ADLs. So that type of thing might help you as well, but we can talk more about it afterwards. Um, really great point though. Any other questions or comments about this model or? confusion about it I just think it's always a moving target to you know so mm -hmm. it, it's not surprising us at the end of the day that she uh, right. had a difficult time and maybe Absolutely. she'll be fine tonight but right. then tomorrow night right. it'll be worse yeah. and it just right. costs a, a very shifting. significant fluctuation right and a lot of it also depends on especially at night it depends on that day it depends on how much cognitive energy was exerted throughout that entire day and that's gonna tell us more about what that person's going to be capable of that evening. I always say, you know, we think about physical energy and exhausting our physical energy throughout the day. We often don't think about exhausting our cognitive energy throughout the day. Um, but it's the same sort of concept. Usually the morning is packed with cognitive activity, right? We usually get dressed, we usually get some sort of shower, or bathed or washed up. We're brushing our teeth, combing our hair, eating breakfast. We're cramming all of that into the morning hours and really using a ton of cognitive energy, which usually kind of wipes people out for a good chunk of the day. Um, so usually by nighttime, people are exhausted. Any of us are exhausted, but people with dementia especially. Okay, I'm gonna move on from this. Can so I, I ask, have, I'll ask you just yeah. one last question regarding those stages? Yeah. So when does the, you're mentioning morning yeah. and night, Yeah. when the times begin to flip for the person who has the dementia. Like when are they, when is their sleep-wake cycle kind of getting right. off? Right, and you try to get it during the day, yeah. and then they wind up sleeping in up at night, right. and, and you it try to flip it. completely flip-flops, so yeah, that's a really good question. Asking about those changes in sleep-wake cycle, I don't know if I will be able to speak to okay. all of that in the time frame that we have today, sure. but um, when I look at something like waking at night or sleeping a lot during the day, mm -hmm. the first thing I want to figure out is, is the why. Mm -hmm. So there's really not one easy answer for that, but I look at a few different things. 
Um, sometimes I use the example, I had, in the past couple of months, I had five people on my caseload who were all referred to me because of waking at night. And each one of those cases had a significantly different reason for the waking at night. So there's really not a one size fits all approach for everyone and we have to be very client specific. So for those five clients, we had one client who had a urinary tract infection, one client who had a side effect from his beta blocker that was causing insomnia. One client was drinking caffeine before bed. Mm. One client was watching the news before bed. <laughs> and then another client didn't have enough activity engagement during the day. And so he wasn't tired at night. Mm. So again, I'm not saying that's true for everyone, but there is usually a different cause for each person. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to kind of speak in blanket statements. But yeah. if I'm going to generalize, usually once we get kind of down here, that's when we see pretty significant sleep-wake cycle changes. Okay. So activity engagement is another way to try to keep that on track. The more active you are during the day, the easier it is to sleep at night. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And we can talk more about that too if that's helpful. Okay. Okay, activity examples. This is by no means a comprehensive list, um, but I figured I'd give you guys just a few ideas, different things I might do with some of my clients. So a couple different categories. We have leisure activities. So knitting, music, looking through photographs, coloring, looking at magazines. Um, I love magazines that are mostly pictures. And then we have household tasks. So again, this might not be for everyone, but I love household tasks for um, people who did a lot of household tasks throughout their life. Makes them feel productive, makes them feel like they're contributing, so therefore I think they're great activities. Physical activities, so things like walking, dancing, exercising, and then a few other kind of odd ones down here. Has anyone heard of a rummage box before? No. Um, so a rummage box for me is a really great activity for my clients who like to rummage anyway. So for anybody who's out there who has a family member who maybe pulls through drawers and picks things out and moves them to somewhere else mm -hmm. and then moves them somewhere else and you have things all over your home. Is anyone comfortable sharing if their family member falls into that category? We have some of that going maybe. on. Maybe. Okay, a little bit of that going on. So they're going to be great candidates for something like a rummage box. Um, I had a client. I'm sorry. Just yeah. Like the like the rummage box. Like do you personalize yeah. that and just take found objects around the house? Exactly. So okay. I had a client last week who is a big rummager. So we decided a rummage box might be a good trial for him. Okay. He's big fly fisher. Um, so I think I have a picture. I don't know if I have a picture of the box, but maybe the making the flies. So we made a rummage box with. Um, he has these kind of like clear boxes with all of his old flies. So we taped that up so he couldn't hurt himself on the sharp hook. But he can look through that. He has a book on fly fishing that goes in the box. Um, he has some different reels in there, some different threads, feathers. What else do we have in there? I think like some old An adult toy box. Yeah, yeah, kind of. That's a great point. Adult toy box. So what I did with him is we just went into, he has a closet in his basement just full of his fishing gear. So I just waited and saw what grabbed his attention. So anything he picked up and started looking at or touching and feeling, we put it in the box. So now if his wife needs a few minutes, she has him sit down at the dining room table, puts his rummage box in front of him, he starts to go through those different materials, gives her a few minutes, and then she can always close up the box and put it away. Also kind of decreases him moving things from some drawers or cabinets to other ones. Um, might not work for everyone, but just an idea. Yeah. Uh, two activities I want to ask you about. Okay. One is socializing. Because when you were talking about the activities mm -hmm. earlier, uh, no, the schedule earlier, mm -hmm. uh, I thought I've tried social activities and they're great. That's great. But I have to, uh, I have to change that day's schedule. So to I accommodate. wasn't sure so far that there's no problem, but I wasn't okay. sure what you, what you thought about that. And then the second question is, I tried, uh, I'm trying movies. Okay. And that's so passive, and you didn't, it's not on your list, yeah. and it is passive, but I finally found a movie I was interested in. I'm okay. going to tell you what it was. Okay. People will laugh. Casablanca. Oh, oh. oh. that's great. Marvelous. Great. 
Well, that's it. So, um, okay, so two questions. One is social engagement. Social engagement is a wonderful activity engagement. We just have to keep in mind the demands that we're placing on someone. So a social interaction or a social environment can put a lot of demands on somebody with dementia that can actually be overstimulating, but not always. So it's, it's kind of a case-by-case -case basis. If it's a small social environment with comfortable people who know how to interact, give enough time, not talking over someone, then it could be a really positive experience. And if you need to shift this schedule to accommodate that and you feel like you're consistently getting positive results, by all means, I think it's great. Um, I would just say keep an eye on it and if you feel like the shift in routine or the social interaction causes agitation, then you might wanna adapt it a little bit. But otherwise, I think it's wonderful. Movies I don't usually bring up only because for most people with dementia it's hard to follow the entire movie. So usually like short little clips, um, usually I recommend like short, not even books on tape, but like poems on tape or short stories on tape, something like that. But again, case by case basis. So if somebody has a movie that they love, um, I have another client, I forget what movie, some sort of like horse racing movie. He watches it every single morning when he gets up. It's ingrained in part of his routine. He knows every word to the movie and he loves it. By all means, if it works and it decreases stress, I think that's wonderful. So I'm not gonna say blanket statement, don't do movies. I think it's a case by case basis. I guess a follow-up on a visual activity. Okay. Um, relatives are great. Close relatives are wonderful. Great. Uh, old friends are terrible because they can't get over the change and my husband's being so quiet. And so we end, they end up talking over him. Okay. Do you have any suggestions? I keep telling people, neighbors, yeah. friends, whatever, please try to engage him. But I guess yeah. they don't understand. Do you have any suggestions of yeah. Suggest to educate people them. what to do? That's a really great question. Could everyone hear that question? Mm -hmm. um, does anyone else have any experience with that and anything that they've tried in terms of education that's been effective? Yeah. I haven't been effective. Okay. But I really try to tell anybody yeah. that's inviting us to go anywhere. Yeah. I mean, my husband used to be able to talk to that wall and find something in common. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but he doesn't talk a lot anymore. Yeah. Um, and so I give them an opportunity to disinvite us okay. <laughs> because sometimes the quiet even is uncomfortable for me. Right. And so I just give them, a, if they're not at that comfort level, mm -hmm. I think it's stressful for everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I always, and it doesn't hurt my feelings yeah. because I would rather everyone be comfortable, right. et cetera. But no one has ever said, yeah. No. <laughs> right, right. And everyone really tries, but you know, I just really opt I give people a chance because it is difficult. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I I've had some clients who we've gone through um thinking of one particular case where the wife said, you know, I really want to still be able to go out and to socialize and I would love for my husband to come with me, but I'm uncomfortable in this social environment. So we talk through you know, maybe the wife needed to be able to give her friends some topics of conversation. What are some things that your husband does still talk about or ask about? Um, or what do you think that you could say to him that would be comfortable? And kind of give those family members or friends some ideas of how to interact. What are appropriate things to say? What are appropriate things to talk about? Um, this particular man is the same man that loved the movie. So he loved this one particular movie, so that was a good topic of conversation, um, or at least something that the, the friend or family could bring up, and then that person could respond. Um, he also was someone who just, he always asked everyone's name, age, and where they went to school. So if, when in doubt, this particular family could default to, let's talk about where you went to school because that's something that he always enjoyed knowing. He wanted to ask everyone. So at least that's a topic that anyone who he's around could still talk about. I don't know if that's helpful to you, but maybe something you could think about. Well, one more thing. He goes to a monthly meeting okay. of retirees okay. who have things in common, something in common. Oh, that's their great. Their backgrounds. Okay. And uh, so I told, mm -hmm. I told everybody when I had the opportunity yeah. privacy about his situation 
and uh, I've asked, I've asked, when I pick him up, I ask, and he's totally quiet. So okay. I asked him a question, and he didn't respond. Yeah. But I feel, if he, and he wants to go, so mm -hmm. I feel it's probably not stressful if he wants to go, and I just take him. I don't know. Yeah. And that's okay, you know, I think if he doesn't seem agitated or bothered at the end of it, then it, it still seems to be a positive experience. And that's another good thing to educate people about. Sometimes it's okay to not have that conversation, right? So again, very high demands that we place on someone in a social environment. Sometimes all that person can take in is just to sit there and observe and listen and they don't necessarily want to or they're not able to participate in a conversation. That's okay, right? As long as it's not stressful to them, I think that's okay. So that might be education. Too. I was just gonna say, um, with my husband, who is <clears throat> has become fairly nonverbal, I mean, he's been in initiating mm -hmm. conversations, so with his best friend, uh, yeah, what we've, started to do is we'll go out to lunch together you know with Andy and then the two of us and then Andy and I talk and Jim is actively there and listening and taking it all in just as you said yeah. so I'm kind of being that bridge to you know to that ask Andy about his yeah. life and what's going on or right. offer, you know so they can still kind of have some communication Absolutely. between me. Right, right. I think that makes sense. I think that's great. And uh, I think a lot of this, too, is what you are comfortable with, right? Are you comfortable with, with um, you know, the your family member <coughs> being silent and being out with you? Would you prefer that people try to engage them? Do you need to have more conversations with those friends to try to promote the engagement? It's really... It's really up to you guys and whatever you feel is going to be most comfortable for your family member. You're all very perceptive. You know your family member better than anybody else. So if you notice that there's a change in their personality or in their mood, you're going to know, okay, that wasn't working. We need to adapt something for the next time. Just like with activities, yeah. I also think um, children, and I mean from little to like 25, yeah. because they're just better able to go with the flow. Yeah. And so if adaptable. someone is interrupting, or they don't look at it that way. They right. just, you know, you want to play volleyball? Okay. <laughs> right. Even though we're playing something else, there right. isn't that, like, turmoil Social of changing or whatever. Right. And, um, and young children yeah. just kind of love you the way you are. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. I think having some younger people is really important. And I mean... When I say a kid, 25, you're still right, right. Yeah, so you know? still a kid, <laughs> right? Absolutely. Yeah, and they're able to adjust much, yeah, quicker. And I think yeah. their expectations are different. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I'm sure some of that is just, you know, changes in our society and what we what we view as more of that social <laughs> norm. Um, but I think that's a really good point too. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing all that. Um, I have a question. Yeah. So the activity uh, looking at a yeah. magazine, which mm -hmm. my husband loves to look through the magazine. Great. But often I initiate questions like, wow, see how much it cost and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And um, whereas I'm looking at a magazine, I'm mm -hmm. internalizing different information. So I don't think I should leave mine on the, alone. I'm not sure. And social activities yeah. with the movies, my husband, uh, when we watch an old movie, Usually I want to know what year was that movie created because, you know, the cars right. may look different if they're in the 40s. Right, And right. I'll go like, oh, you were such and such an age at that time. Yeah. Oh, do you remember that car? Did your dad have a car like that? My, so That's we use great. it as a, a point of um, That's conversation great. because it's still in the back of his Perfect. mind, that part. So what you're doing is, do I have reminiscing on here? I don't have mm -hmm. reminiscing on so reminiscing is mm -hmm. another great activity. What you're doing is you're combining. You're combining one of these with reminiscing and you're putting them together. I think that's wonderful. Um, what you've done is you, we're gonna talk about task upgrades and downgrades. Very rarely do I do too much upgrading. I'm usually talking about how to simplify things, but you've <coughs> taken something that's um, fairly simple, but you can upgrade it a little bit to get even more out of it for your husband. Your husband, you said? Yeah, Okay. because I'm I think thinking that's great. it's still there. Right. There's still some memories about 
what things look like. Right. Now, if I ask them about something that happened an hour ago, it's not there. Right. But, but there's that, long term yeah, memory. Long term memory. Perfect. I'm trying to pull from the long term memory yeah. and create a conversation so we can still talk about things that. I think that's wonderful. You can do the same type of thing with looking through old photographs, magazines. Honestly, I do it with puzzles too. When I'm doing a puzzle with somebody after it's done, I'm still using reminiscing. Like, oh, look at the horse in this picture. Did you ever, there was one client I had who used to ride horses growing up, so then that sparked a conversation about riding horses growing up. You can really pull reminiscing into a whole lot of these activities, and I think that is a great thing to do. Thank you for sharing that, that's really great. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I wanted to talk about on here. Some of these are more sensory. So when I was talking about those different cognitive levels, when we were talking about a level two, postural actions, sensory oriented activities, that's when we're going to talk about things like petting a dog or a cat, um, twiddle muff. Has anyone heard of a twiddle muff before? So that would be this thing. I have a picture of one of my clients using it. So this is one of my clients with a twiddle muff. So meeting her at her cognitive level. She's sensory oriented in nature. We want something that will allow her to engage, but allow her to be successful. So anything more complex would be too difficult. So this is just it's a muff for your hands, but it has all sorts of different things to engage with in terms of sensation. So it usually has like zippers, ties, different buttons and snaps, beads, ribbons, um, keeps her occupied. And then this is one of my other clients. So just a few examples for you. This woman um, has been an artist her entire life. So her husband said to me, she can't paint anymore. She can't do it like she used to. She never starts it. A big part of it was setup, right? So it's unrealistic to say, okay, Jane, you're just gonna go and start painting. That's really complex. We have to think about what are the materials we need? What are we going to paint? What um, how are we going to set it up? What room are we going to paint in? So if we're able to take the materials out for her and start the activity, so I started to paint over here, gave her everything she needed, and then she was able to start painting. So again, we had to kind of adapt our expectations. I think the husband was a little disappointed to see more of an abstract painting um, than the type of artwork that she used to do. But to me, this is really great. It's capitalizing on what has been important to her her entire life, and she's still able to do it. She might not be painting exactly what she used to, but she enjoyed the entire process. So again, process, not product. Okay, a couple more examples. So this is my client who was making flies. I had no idea how to make a fly for fly fishing before two weeks ago. Now I do. Um, and then this is just an example of one of my client's basements love to organize things. I was like, oh, this looks so nice. So he is definitely someone who we can give him a box of all sorts of stuff and say, okay, we need help sorting this. So a box full of, whether it's tools, for this particular client I knew he was safe, other clients I wouldn't be giving them something like tools. But for this client we could do tools. We have a box of like different types of screws and nuts, bolts, just dumped them all into a box and said, really need your help sorting all these out. He was thrilled, because clearly he likes organization. <laughs> so we had a couple different jars, you know, gave him a little sample. Uh, nuts in here, bolts in here, screws in here, and he spent a long time sorting all of those out. So again, I frame it as, I need your help. These all got mixed up in a box. Can you help me sort them? Thrilled to be able to help me out. Um, the wife can use that same exact strategy on a regular basis. You can dump them all back in, recycle that activity. Um, again, product, process, not product. I don't care if they're sorted appropriately or perfectly. It's just about the process. All right. Uh, any questions about choosing activities? Uh, now I we're going to talk into some... I have just a quick talk. question yeah. about time. Okay. Uh, and maybe you're going to get to this. Um, is, it, is there any kind of expectation or is there... How to put it... it is there some realistic way of thinking about how much time a person will spend uh, in any given activity, like doing a puzzle, say, or whatever yeah, it might be? Yeah, that's a really good question. So that's another tricky one where I do cognitive assessments that tell me a little bit more about what's a realistic time frame for engagement. Um, 
I think this is another one where observation of other activities. So if you observe your wife engaging in other types of activities and see ballpark, about how long does she stay with the same thing? So um, if she's trying to, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I can use an example. Um, even like getting dressed, we could take components of that. Does she need cues to get dressed? Is she able to do the whole activity on her own? Does she need kind of redirection throughout the process? That usually clues us in a little bit about how much time someone can engage, meaning are they going to be able to engage for five minutes without a cue, for two minutes without a cue, for a half an hour without a cue. Without a, cue. Um, a lot of it, again, is trial and error. So it might be that someone can engage for a half an hour, but they need a verbal cue every five minutes in order to do that. Other people might not need a cue at all for that half an hour and they can continue to engage. So it really kind of depends on where someone's at. A lot of it is just trial and error. I wish I had a better answer for So it's not necessarily a reasonable objective to say, I'm looking for an activity that's gonna keep her busy for 30 minutes. Not necessarily. It's not really a reasonable goal to have. <sighs> It's hard for me to say for sure. Um, for some clients who are, when I think about those levels again, some clients who fall into say like a, a level three. Um, at the lower end of a level three, the maximum amount of time that they can engage in a task without a, without a cue is one to two minutes. So a 30 minute activity is going to be an unrealistic expectation. For somebody at like a higher end of a four, um, 30 minutes is a reasonable expectation. So I think part of it just depends on kind of where they're at. Sorry, I wish I had a better, better answer for you on that one. Um, yeah, some of it's just trial and error. So I'm just gonna talk through some of this. Um, I'll try to get through some of it fairly quickly so that we have a lot of time to go through the activity because I definitely wanna hear and have you guys share. But in terms of adapting activities, I'm gonna talk about it in three different parts. So I'm going to talk about how to simplify the activity or the task itself simplify the environment, which plays a really, really big role in being able to do a task, and then also our communication, which plays into it too. Okay, simplifying activity. So I have an example here with some of our objectives. Okay, so I use the example here of washing dishes. Again, that may not be a realistic activity for all of your family members. I'm just using it for a sample. So the first thing we're going to think about is how can we reduce the complexity of the task? So if we think about washing dishes as a whole, what's involved in washing dishes? Well, it depends on each person because everyone washes differently. But theoretically, let's say you're the kind of person who you fill up one side of the sink with hot soapy water. So you wash your plate, then you rinse it, then you dry it. So again, not everyone does it in the exact same order. You might you might not be filling the tub up, you might be washing each one, you might wash them all and then rinse them all, so there's going to be slight variation. But let's say we're gonna do it this way. So the first thing to think about, reducing the complexity, we wanna make sure we are thinking about everything involved and making it simpler. So maybe we only wash the plates and the silverware instead of more complicated glasses and bottles. So washing a glass is a little bit more complex because it involves um, a little bit more motor movement for simplifying that. Plate and silverware, it's a little bit easier, right? Kind of like a back and forth motion, put it away. So if that's complex for your family member, break it down, let's make it simpler. If silverware and plates are too complex, let's just do plates. So we're gonna break down the task to make it easier. Other ways to adapt washing dishes reduce the number of steps. So we have multiple steps involved in washing dishes. Maybe you do the washing and rinsing and they just dry the plates. Maybe you wash and then they rinse and dry. So you're going to adapt the task and adapt the different steps to allow your family member to engage. So it might not be realistic for them to do the whole task. Then we're gonna talk about changing the objects. Size, material, weight, color, all sorts of things go into the type of object. So if your sink is white and you have white plates, that's gonna be kind of a hard activity, especially for somebody who has visual deficits. So something that we can do is consider color plates. Maybe a glass plate is too heavy. 
so we want to think about plastic plates. So just simple ways to adapt an activity. We want to change the purpose. I know I keep talking about this. The purpose is not the end product. So if we really need our dishes washed and cleaned, then we are not going to use this as an activity for our family member. If we're using washes, di washing dishes as an activity, the purpose is for your family member to engage. It's not about if the dishes are actually clean or go in the right place. Okay, so if you're saying, oh my gosh, but my family member doesn't clean them, and then they put them back in the cabinet and then it creates a whole mess for me, then washing dishes might not be a good activity in general. Or maybe we need to do something like put a plastic tub at the end of the sink and they put all of the clean dishes in there and then you know you just have to rewash that bin. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and then set up. So maybe it's something as simple as you fill up the sink with water, place the soap on the sponge, and then they do it. This might seem really simple, but I absolutely did this with one of my clients, I don't know, maybe about a year ago. Um, the wife said to me, I would love for my husband to be able to wash the dishes, but it drives me crazy because he just washes it with his hand. He will not use the sponge and the soap. Um, so I said, okay, let's see how you do it. Show me how you do it. She just kind of stood there and would say, use the sponge, use the sponge. He was like, no, 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 we're good. So all we had to do is put the soap on the sponge. Don't say anything, just hand it to him. More often than not, they'll take it and just start to use it. So that was the case for this person. Verbal cues didn't work, visual cue worked out. So simple adaptations like that can be effective. Okay, any questions about this? I'm gonna use the same type of strategies for another one. So you guys are gonna help me with this one. So we have a puzzle. How can we reduce the complexity of a puzzle? Not a lot of pieces. Good. Reduce the number of pieces. Great example. How could we reduce the number of steps? Redo the outline. Great. Do the outline for them. That's a great idea. What else could we do to reduce the number of steps? Separate the colors. Good. Separate the colors. What else? I'm thinking even, even broader. We pull the box off the shelf. We open the box. Right? We don't think about these little things as being steps, but they are. That's a big part of it is pulling it off the shelf, opening the box, pulling the pieces Turn out the pieces of the box. All facing in the right direction. Absolutely. Yeah. Putting them facing yeah. the right direction, face yeah. up, or even facing in the orientation that they're supposed to go. Great. That's reducing complexity and number of steps. Awesome. How about changing the objects? Size, material. So we talked about number of pieces, which is great. What else could we do to change the objects? We'll make sure it's against a, a, a very contrasty background. Great. Contrasting background. Wonderful. How about the puzzle itself? Large pieces. Absolutely. The pieces themselves, if they're larger, that's going to be good. And we can make sure the puzzle itself has really contrasting colors. Yeah. Yeah, you could, if you wanted to use the puzzle again, you yeah. could take some pieces and, and pre sort of group the pre put them together and tape them on the back so. perfect I love that idea so you kind of already group them together and make it even simpler cool idea I love that never done something like that before yeah do you know what you could do also you could take a picture of a family member yeah and make a puzzle out of that that is a great idea take a picture of a family member and make a puzzle out of that make it really familiar yeah love it that's great wonderful okay how about the purpose is the process and not the product. What do I mean by that when it comes to a puzzle? It's not about finishing. Exactly. It doesn't matter if the puzzle gets finished, right? Great. Okay. Um, set up and start the activity for your family member. That's kind of self-explanatory and you guys kind of already gave ideas that hit on that. Great. Okay. So I have a few puzzle examples. So which of these puzzles would be the hardest to complete? This one. Great. Why is that? Too many, too many pieces, too many dark, pieces good, so not good color contrast, mm -hmm. absolutely. And they're smaller pieces too. Mm -hmm. Which one's in the middle? The horses. Horses. Good. horses. Mm -hmm. Great, so slightly better contrast, still a fair number of pieces, but they're a little bit larger. And then which one's the easiest? The flowers. Flowers. Right. flowers. So high color contrast, not as many pieces, pieces are larger. Does that all make sense? Mm -hmm. Any questions about adapting the task itself? 
All right, now we're gonna talk about the environment. So, environment. Okay, I'm making a sandwich. Again, might not be the best activity for all of your family members, but we're just gonna go with it for an example. Okay, so reducing clutter and visual distraction. We wanna remove all unnecessary items from the table or counter. Consider a plain colored tablecloth instead of one with a pattern. Excuse me. We also wanna think about reducing noise. So any extra television, radio, conversations that are going on in the background, while we might be able to tune those things out easily, it's gonna be a lot harder for your family member to concentrate on doing something like making a sandwich if there's a lot going on in the background. Providing adequate lighting. So increasing lighting, consider a tablecloth to reduce the glare. So again, something that we don't always think about, but if we have glare on the table, what do we do? Usually just shift our weight, right? We're just shifting side to side so that we're not affected by the glare. Is your family member with dementia always going to do that? Probably not. So that glare might be impacting them, but they no might not know how to adjust to um, reduce its impact. We also wanna think about removing dangerous items. So in the case of making a sandwich, removing the really sharp knives. They might not even need a knife to make a sandwich, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, providing only items needed for a specific task. So setting out sandwich ingredients and utensils needed to make the sandwich. So this actually comes up quite often. I've had a handful of clients who say to me, my family member can't make a sandwich anymore. A lot of it had to do with the way that we were setting up the environment. If we put out the bread, the lunch meat, the lettuce, maybe we already pre-sliced a tomato and we have it laying on the counter and our family member with dementia just has to put the pieces together, that might be more realistic as opposed to initiating, going to the refrigerator, thinking about everything that needs to go into a sandwich and making it themselves. And then we will also want to provide the items within someone's visual field. So again, being behind a closed door, in a cabinet, in a refrigerator, not within their visual field, it's going to be harder for them to engage. Any questions about this? You guys all still with me? Yeah. All right, so then we have coloring. So we're going to talk through the same thing. So how can we reduce clutter or visual distraction to engage someone in coloring? What would the environment look like? TV's off. Good white table. What'd you say? The TV's off. Good TV's off. Good. So that's also about noise. Great. How about mm -hmm. adequate lighting? Mm -hmm. Kind of self-explanatory, right? We don't want a really dim room. Really, really bright fluorescent lights might not be the best either. How about dangerous items? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly what that might be, but possible that we could have something on the table that might be dangerous. Mm -hmm. For somebody who puts a lot of things in their mouth, we want to be conscious of not having anything that would be toxic. Um, providing only items needed for the task. So what items will we have out on the table for coloring? The coloring crayons. Coloring book. book, right, coloring utensils. Well, one page for the coloring book. Great, so maybe we just have that one page. Great, so reducing the complexity of the task. Maybe we're not giving them a whole box of crayons. Maybe we're pulling out one or two colors. Sharpen maybe we them. start, what'd you say? Sharpen them for them. Absolutely, sharpen the pencils for them. Yeah. But, well, it occurs to me there might be, you know, certain tasks, you know, certain kind of coloring book that has very complicated design on yes. it, you yes. don't want to give that to the person because that's Great just going point. to get confused. So something that's a little bit, you know, relatively simple that they can, where the, where the uh, outlines are, are, are fairly, uh, uh, fairly obvious and something that's fairly easy to color. Absolutely. It also occurs to me that the, the materials used, you know, using colored pencils might be more difficult than using crayons. Right. Or vice versa. Absolutely. Um, so those kinds, of, those exactly. kinds of considerations. Absolutely. They're all great points. So even though I hear so many great things these days about adult coloring books, and trust me, I love to color too. I love adult coloring books. But are they the best for people with dementia? Mm -hmm. No. They're usually very, very intricate designs, right mm -hmm. to your point. I think that's a fabulous point. So we, even though adult coloring books seem like a great idea, they're usually really complex. So something more simplistic. Um, it's usually a better fit for someone with dementia. Um, also considering, again, their, their motor abilities, their physical abilities. So if someone has a really hard time holding a thin pencil, maybe a thicker crayon 
or maybe something with, I call them built up utensils, whether it's a fork, a knife, or something you write with. They make these things that make them a lot thicker so that they can hold it a lot easier. Really good for people who have arthritis. Um, so something to consider in terms of adapting those items needed. Um, I also, sometimes I follow different um, like caregiver Facebook groups just to kind of see what's going on out there. And there was a video posted one time of a woman, um, a woman posted of her mom and her mom was coloring. So she had out her coloring book and the crayons. She was coloring and then the daughter handed her mom a cookie and her mom started coloring on the cookie. Mm -hmm. um, and, and her caption was kind of disheartening, like, oh, mom doesn't know how to eat anymore. Is that true? No. Not necessarily. It's all about the environment, mm -hmm. right? So what could we do to promote her mom eating the cookie? Not give it to her when she's coloring. Right. <laughs> Not give it to her when she's coloring. So what could we do to change the environment? No cookies. No cookies. <laughs> we could do that. But we could also just remove the coloring book, remove the crayons, and even better, put out a napkin or a little plate or a glass of water. Make it look like it's time it's to eat. Deep. Right? So just simple cues in our environment make a big difference. Also thinking about putting something within a person's visual field. Um, for a lot of my clients, again, in that kind of uh, three range, manual actions, their visual field is going to be 24 inches in front of them. So I'm not going to expect them to be able to engage with something across the room, across the table. It really has to be something right directly in front of them on the table. Um, so just, again, something to consider when you're thinking about how to adapt coloring. We're not going to put the items out across the table and say, okay, time to color. We want to really set that activity up as much as possible. Okay, any questions about this? Have another little sample. Okay, so which of these is going to be the hardest to complete a coloring activity? The one at the top. Right, one at the top. Which is going to be kind of in between? The one on the right. Why is that? Too many different colors. So a few, you know, few different things going on here. What else is kind of difficult about this particular table? It's not set up for coloring. Not set up for coloring. Good. What else? Brown. <laughs> there's glare on glare, the Glare, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's big glare going on over here. So that's going to be a lot harder to, to focus on what's necessary. So it's confusing Great. With the, we, are those placemats or dishes? Or Good placemats? question. I think they're placemats. But again, really mm -hmm. kind of throwing off what this table needs to be used for. This one's still not perfect, but much better, right? Mm -hmm. So like flowers, we're probably going to take the flowers off the table if we're going to do coloring. But at least this is a pretty neutral, um, we don't have kind of color color contrast between the floor and the table and the chairs but that's okay so um, white tablecloth it's going to be easier to color or eat or really do anything at this table um, than it is going to be at the other two tables I have a question. Yeah. how do you introduce coloring how do I introduce coloring yeah, to, to, the, to the your husband your client or whatever yeah but how do you introduce coloring if that's, that's something question. that yeah if that's something that I think based on what the family tells me yeah. might be a possibility um, I truthfully, and I'll talk about this with communication too, I don't do a lot of talking to set something up. I usually just go right into the activity. Talking to set it up increases risk for resistance. Mm -hmm. So I usually just kind of sit down next to the person and I'll start to do it. So the other day I was at an adult day program. And my client was becoming kind of agitated and they were trying to redirect her into coloring. She wasn't really excited about it at first. I just sat down next to her. She said, I'm not coloring. I don't want to do this. So I just started coloring. I just started. It was like a sunset or something. So I'm coloring, coloring. She said, you know, I really don't think purple is the best color. I said, you're probably right. I think maybe orange. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Handed her the orange one. Can you help me with this? Oh, yeah, of course. She started to color, pass it off to her. I could walk away. Um, that's not going to be the case with everyone. You know, she kind of helped me input a little bit. Um, somebody else, again, I might start to color and say, oh, do you want to do part of this for me? Or maybe I give them their own separate sheet, mm -hmm. um, hand them a crayon or colored pencil and see if I can get them started. I'm usually going to cue them. If, if they're having trouble initiating, sometimes I cue them on exactly where I want them to start because just looking at a blank sheet or even if it's like a flower outline or something mm -hmm. can be kind of overwhelming. Like, where do I, what do I start with? So I'll say, I need this petal. I'll just start to color that. So at least it gives them a place to start. 
Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This goes beyond college, just in any activity. What if they're just resistant? They don't want to do whatever you bring up. They're, uh, Great question. I actually have a whole slide on that at the end of the presentation. So that's probably the biggest question I get is what happens when my family member says no? They're resistant to everything. So that um, is almost like a different model and way of thinking about things, but I'm going to try to give you guys some ideas towards the end. If I don't answer your question, we're going to dive more into that too. I'm going to have you email me or call me because that's a whole other conversation, but really, really good question. Does anybody else have that issue? Yes. yes. Yeah. 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 Had a feeling. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's good. We'll make sure we leave time for that slide. Or the other issue may yeah. be, I, I'm not ready for that. Which is, okay. that, which is, which is, which which, is a nice no. Which is a nice no of, <laughs> of right. <laughs> exactly. It's a nice no. Or um, mm -hmm. why am I coloring? Mm -hmm. That's for yeah. uh, the grandkid or something. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's yeah. a really good point. And that type of thing can come up. Um, because then coloring might not be the best activity if it's causing like a little frustration but some of my clients will say oh we're coloring this for the grandkids or they wait until the grandkids are over mm -hmm. and they say oh you're doing this to help the grandkids mm -hmm. um so sometimes framing it in that way can be helpful again it might not work for everyone and so it might not be the best activity for everyone um but there sometimes are little ways around that. Although I just recently had an experience where I do coloring and my husband came over and said he took a big interest like what's going on here. Yeah. So I think I'm going to get him a book and next time he comes and hangs on the shoulder I'm going to yeah. say look at this one do you want to yeah. try I mean it I wasn't That's reading great. that properly I right. was reading it as just him being interested but I think right. he's more than just interested I think he wants to try it. I and think he didn't so want to say that. Absolutely. And I think a big part of it, you know, I know that for all of you, the goal is that we can find set up activities. We want to be able to find things that your family member can engage in so we can give you guys a few minutes of rest. Um, the likelihood that someone will engage is higher if we do the activity with them. So with something like coloring, there's probably not going to be as much pushback if we sit and do the coloring next to them or do the coloring with them. So again, I know it's not realistic for everyone, but just something to keep in mind. Um, I think you make a really great point that if we can involve our family member in something we find meaningful, that's another great way to give you a little bit of respite. You can still do something that's good for you and involve them. So I had a um, client one time where the caregiver was a huge scrapbooker. And she was like, well, my husband can't do scrapbooking. I said, no, but let's think about how can we take components of that and adapt it for him. He was another guy who loved to sort things. So she just took all of her scrapbook papers and kind of mixed them up and said, oh, I need your help sorting the colors. So then he had a whole file folder and he could sort all of her pieces of paper for her scrapbooking. So it's something that they could kind of do together. Still gave her her little bit of respite for her to scrapbook, but he could be engaged in the process. Um, okay, this example, this is actually my family. We love puzzles. So my sisters and I are doing a puzzle. Um, this is a little complex, right? So we want to think about if we had something like this, I always think about how can we take something and downgrade it, right? So this task can be adapted to make it slightly easier. What could we do with something like this to make it easier? Get another puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Number one, get another puzzle. Yeah. This is way too many pieces, way too small. Good. Um, what else about this activity might be more complex? I know you can't really tell, but the three of us are standing around a table. Well, the, the colors, the, the yellows, the pinks, they're right. all, they're yeah. not differentiated. Right, there's not a whole lot of contrast in mm -hmm. this. Also, even just components like the three of us standing, we're putting higher demands on the activity by the three of us standing and having to kind of coordinate around each other, move around each other's arms, that's making the task more complex. So not only simplifying the puzzle itself, but the three of us want to somehow be sitting at a table in a way that we're not going to constantly be crossing arms with each other, that we can more easily access all of these pieces. And then how else can we adapt the environment? What's going on with like this table? There's a lot of it's glare. glare. Yeah, a lot of glare. So huge issue when we're trying to see what pieces we need for the puzzle. So it would be better if we had a tablecloth. Um, again, this, because of the size of the puzzle, we needed a big table, but it would be better if we had a smaller puzzle and also a smaller table. All right. 
We have a term in occupational therapy, we call it the just right fit or the just right challenge. The goal is we want to think about the person. We say person, environment, occupation, PEO. So person, what are our abilities or the per your family member's abilities? How do we match that with the activity and the environment so that the person can be successful? We want to find that just right fit. Okay. Any questions about environment? All right. We also want to talk about communicating effectively. Again, I'm going to, I think, move through some of this quickly because I want to make sure we get to the resistance slide. Um, so these are some basic communication strategies. Most of you, I'm sure, have picked up on a lot of this just through trial and error with your family members. But important things to keep in mind when it comes to activity as well. We want to use statements instead of, instead of abstract questions or even just questions in general. So instead of, do you want to do a puzzle? How about, we're going to do a puzzle? Doesn't mean you have to say it in a really aggressive or demanding way, but you're giving a concrete statement. You're not giving more than two choices at a time. Any more than that's gonna be really complex, and visual cues are easier to process than verbal. Meaning, even something like, I'm choosing a shirt. So instead of saying, do you want to wear the red shirt or do you want to wear the blue shirt, it's going to be easier to give them the sample. Here's the red shirt, here's the blue shirt. We're just going to show it to them. It's going to be easier for them to pick it when they can see it. Does that make sense? <laughs> then we have no more than one or two steps at a time. So we're not going to give them a whole long sequence. And then we always want to acknowledge what our family member is saying. At the very least, we want to acknowledge the emotion behind what they're saying. So this is going to come up more when it comes to resistance. Um, we always want to go along with their belief of what's true, so we're not going to try to reason with them or argue with them. Redirect if they become agitated. So a lot of times I use an activity box. So I'll have a box that any type of activity we think has potential goes in the box. That way, when your family member's agitated and you need an activity to redirect them, you can just pull something out of the box. You don't have to sit there and think, oh gosh, what am I going to try now? You have your box, pull something out, can use that. If that one activity doesn't work, throw it back in the box, try something else. Can yeah. you give an example of what might be in a box? What be, might be in the box. So a recent box, I have a small puzzle. I have um, headphones with CD that the person really likes. I have some old um, cards that they got for Father's Day, Valentine's Day, that type of thing. Um, we put in there, let's see, what else? Um, pictures of his children. Oh, this is the same man that we have a separate rummage box for the fly fishing. So we added a few flies in there too, in his little container. So really anything that's going to be calming, soothing, meaningful for that person. Um, does that answer your question? Yes. I'm not good at this, I'm sure you guys can tell. I have to work on that. Speak slowly. We always want to allow enough time for the person to respond. So that I try to do, but I know I speak kind of quickly. Um, it can take a long time for people with dementia to process verbal cues or any kind of cues. So we want to make sure we're allowing enough time for them to process before we assume that they can't or that they don't want to engage. We want to do our best to look directly at them when we're speaking to them. And then I keep talking about different types of cues. I just want to share with you what they are. So occupational therapists like myself, but also physical therapists, speech therapists, we all document in terms of the volume of cues that we are giving to our clients. We find it very helpful to differentiate, so I think this is something we should talk about with all of our clients. Visual cues are just that. They're things that we can see. So something like this, a little sign on the drawer that says socks, that's an example of a visual cue. Other people in their home, they might have a picture of a toilet and the word toilet on the bathroom. Um, so that would be an example of a visual cue. Demonstration, if I'm asking someone to put their shirt on, or maybe I'm simplifying it even more, put your arm in the sleeve. I might have a shirt and I'm going to put my arm in the sleeve at the same time. So I'm demonstrating for them what I'm asking them to do. Verbal cues, anything that we're saying. So we, I would say probably overuse verbal cues typically and underuse the other three. Tactile cues can also be really effective. So tactile cues are just gentle touch cues. Um, I had a 
client one time who um, the family told me that she was no longer able to feed herself. So I went and just tried to observe what was going on. So she could grasp the spoon, but she wasn't bringing the spoon to her mouth. So all we did was just gentle, little gentle touch on her hand. That was enough to initiate mm -hmm. that movement. So I'm not saying that will work 100% of the time, but tactile cues can be really effective. Another client used to um, be fearful going down the stairs. There were a lot of things involved in that, dark stairwell, rushing, the husband was rushing a little bit. So a few things we needed to address, but we coupled it with tactile cues. So just something as simple as like a little tap on her ankle, she would move one foot down. Another tap on her ankle would move the other foot. So that freezing that was happening because of anxiety was broken with a gentle tactile cue. So just something to consider. We often don't think about um, how effective tactile cueing can be. That's something you might want to use. Um, any questions about types of cues? Other just general considerations. Again, we talked about routine. It does not mean you can't change up routine once in a while, but if we can fit the activity into an established routine, that's our goal. We don't want to rush. We love the catchphrase, relax the rules. Um, again, purpose is not the end product. We also want to always enhance comfort. So if someone's not comfortable, it's going to be harder for them to engage. We have a little saying in occupational therapy called, um, what, are, what is it? Um, proximal stability equals distal mobility. That means if we're supported at our core, it's going to be easier to use our hands. So if someone's not comfortable and supported where they're sitting, it's not realistic that they're going to have an easy time using their hands for feeding, for, for eating, for engaging in sewing, needlepoint, lacing, coloring, anything that involves our hands is going to be easier if we are supported. That's true of everyone, not just people with dementia. Um, I mentioned activity box. I love them. Doesn't work for everybody, but I think it's a nice kind of fallback for when we really need something. Okay. So here's where I have barriers to engagement. Okay, so this is what I'm asked about probably more frequently than anything else when it comes to activity engagement. So what are some barriers? A big one is time. We don't always have the time to invest in helping our family members. We don't always have the support or assistance available to us. I wish I could tell you that I could change those things. Unfortunately, sometimes they are just barriers. Give yourselves a break. It's not always realistic that you're going to be able to help or engage your family member at every minute of every single day. Of course, if we can establish routines where we know that that chunk of the day, we're going to at least trial some different activities so that we have a better sense of what might be a setup activity, we can do that. But it might not be realistic that that's going to be something that happens all day, every day. Um, also, when we talk about activity engagement, um, we don't always talk about the benefits of rest. So it really does need to be kind of a back and forth. So if we have someone highly engaged in activity, it's okay to take a rest break after that before we engage in another activity, right? So it can kind of be activity, rest, activity, rest. Doesn't have to be activity all day, every day, because that can be overstimulating. Okay, resistance. So whenever, I kind of classify resistance as a dementia-related behavior, if you will, for lack of a better term. When I look at something like resistance, the first thing I want to figure out is why is that resistance happening? Just like something like waking at night, where I was saying there's five different people with five different triggers, resistance is going to be the same type of thing. So if someone is resistant, we have to first figure out why. That's the hardest part of the process. So figuring out why, um, I usually use something called the triadic model. So we're going to think about three different categories. One is what's going on internally with that person with dementia. So some examples of that are things we have here. So they're uncomfortable. Maybe they have pain that they can't express. Maybe they're too hot or they're too cold. They're overstimulated. They're really tired. They have a sense of loss of control, meaning they, they feel as though they no longer can contribute in a meaningful way. 
Um, I often say if I ask somebody with dementia yes or no question, nine times out of ten, what's the answer? No. 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 Right. So my kind of theory as to why that is is maintaining control. If I say yes to a question when I really don't know what's being asked of me, that opens me up for a lot of unknown. That's kind of a scary thought. If I say no, I maintain control. Nothing changes. Nothing's going to happen to me. I don't have to do anything. So I'm always going to say no. So I really think that that no answer kind of comes from this sense of loss of control. So if that's the case, we're going to take that question away. Right, so just like I was saying, instead of saying, do you want to do a puzzle? Do you want to color? The answer is usually going to be no, even if they will engage and do enjoy it. So we're going to take that away, and we might just say, time to color. Or maybe we're not going to say that at all, and we're just going to get out the coloring book. Or we're just going to get out the magazine or the photo album. Huh. Um, usually taking away the verbal cues, taking away how we verbally set up an activity, will decrease a lot of resistance. So even think about that guy I was talking about with the sponge and the washing dishes. If I said use the sponge, he would say no. <laughs> if I hand him the sponge with the soap on it, did he use it? Yes. And he wasn't angry or frustrated about it. So taking away that choice or providing the activity with more of a visual cue or setup is going to decrease resistance. We also want to think about time of day and communication style. Yeah. I was just thinking, you know, I mean, let's say it's time to color. So mm -hmm. you get out the crayons and whatever, and, and you, you get the person to start coloring, and maybe you do it with them. But after they've done it, you know, a half a dozen times, the, the message keeps coming at you over and over again, I don't like this activity. I don't want to do this. Uh, that That's also, you know, there's a, a certain amount of trial and error there, yeah. I, I think, and, and sometimes that's a, that's a real objection. They really don't enjoy it. They that don't get is, any satisfaction out of it. That is absolutely so. true. So I don't want to imply that, that we need to force someone to do activity. Of course, if they don't enjoy it or they appear agitated or they're really not getting anything out of it, we're not going to force it. More often than not, if someone engages for a period of time, it's okay to do it repetitively, and they usually, typically, don't necessarily get frustrated by the repetitive nature. Again, that's not always the case. Um, in the event that you do it a handful of times and now there's an outright, outright objection, then we scrap it. We come up with something else. And I think that's why I like this idea of an activity box, or at least a list. We're not going to have just one activity that's helpful. We want a whole bunch, because if we get resistance to one, we want a different one that we can fall back on. Yeah. So, so just follow. So even if the person says, you know, I didn't really like that very much. Yeah. And I don't really want to do that again. Mm -hmm. uh, but then you sort of drag them and you, you know, you sort of do it anyway. Like my wife, I used to take to Tai Chi classes. Okay. You know, and she said over and over again, I'm not really interested in that. But she does it. I mean, okay. she, she participates. Yeah. She does it. But then she always says afterwards, you know, I really didn't enjoy that. And then mm -hmm. the next week we'll go again. And, and, and she'll do it, but, mm -hmm. but she says, you know, she I don't like that. Uh, so, and are you doesn't. with her in the Tai Chi classes? Pardon me? Are you with her in the Tai Chi classes? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. When you're there, are you, is your perception that she's not enjoying it when you're there? Um, my perception is that she's going along with it. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Um, so it's, it's not something that she's doing because this is really fun to do, yeah. but she's doing it because, you know. Because it's something to do. That's what, that's mm -hmm. sort of what is That's a good question. Of. You know, I will say, like, I have a lot of clients who attend adult day programs. And I know, based on being in this, I go to one particular program on kind of a regular basis, so I see a lot of my clients overlap quite frequently. There's one in particular I know that she loves it. She loves everything. She loves the social atmosphere. She loves the activities. And the second she leaves, she tells her family, that was awful, and I'm never going back. But I know, and we all, the staff knows, the family knows, that when she's there, she loves it. So I don't want to say 100% of the time that, that that information is true. You know, I really, truly believe that she's enjoying it when she's there. I can't say the same for your wife. She really might not like Tai Chi. 
I would say trust your instinct on that. You know your wife better than anyone else. If you really think that she does not enjoy it, then it might be worth changing up the activity. Maybe Tai Chi is not the best, but maybe there's something well, else that's but, meaningful. But if she goes along with it, yeah. is, then is it, is it valid to say, well, she hasn't, she doesn't object to the point where she mm -hmm. absolutely refuses to do it. Right, right. She'll, she'll do it. Yeah. But she, but, she, but she doesn't seem to actively be getting into it. Okay. Um, and I think that's okay. I mean, if she doesn't appear really agitated by it, really bothered by it, it's not throwing off her routine, she's still getting some benefit out of it, especially Tai Chi, that's a great phys physically engaging activity. Right. Um, it's a social environment. There's a lot of benefits to that and if it's not causing her significant negative changes if it were me I would say I would just continue to try it if you feel like you're getting an adamant reaction that she's not enjoying it or again when you're there you're noticing she's starting to get restless uncomfortable <coughs> agitated that would be a good time to change it up does that answer your question do you have some recommendations for adult day products in the city yeah. Um, I, maybe Felicia and Allison can take it from there. I'm not as well versed in um, in the city limits. I do a lot of work in the suburbs, so I know a little bit more out there, but I'm sure these ladies can help us out. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so again, if I'm thinking about resistance, I talked a lot about kind of these internal factors that might be happening. So loss of control, pain, discomfort, those types of things. Communication style really really big impact on resistance so again removing those verbal cues just trying to set up the activity our tone of voice and our body language and i'm sure most of you have figured this out through trial and error too they play a huge role in how our family member is going to respond right so if we're excited about something there's a better chance that our family member is going to be excited so a lot of times they're mimicking the social behaviors of people that they trust so if we act calm, comfortable, happy, excited, it's going to be easier for them to feel the same way. If we're nervous, scared, unsure if they're going to say no, um, expecting resistance, it's going to be easier for them to say no. We also want to think about the environment. Again, so making sure we're setting up the environment for success. If we have an environment that's overstimulating, it's going to be much more likely that someone is going to resist engaging because it's harder for them, it's more complex. Um, there's a lot more demands on them to try to process all of that environmental stimuli and then they have to process the information needed to engage in that task, it's too much. So this simpler we can make the environment, the higher likelihood they'll be able to and, and willing to engage in an activity. Once we figure out what's triggering the resistance, again, this is kind of the hardest process, and truthfully, I do kind of whole long spiels just on figuring out triggers, so I know it's not that simple to do in just a few minutes, but we want to think about, once we figure the trigger out, how can we then adapt the situation, the task, and our communication in the environment? So we've kind of been talking about that today already. Addressing underlying concerns. So if the person doesn't feel safe or comfortable or in control, trying to give them a better sense of that. If something doesn't work or if they say no, walk away. Go in a different room, give you a few minutes to relax, come back, try it again. You could try the same activity again, you could try a different activity. I, I do this truthfully all the time in my work. A trial and error is a big part of all of this, right? So. I might try one activity with someone, I'm getting resistance, totally okay. I pack the activity up, I say thank you so much for your time, I walk away as if I'm leaving, give it a few minutes, come back in, present the activity in a different way or present a new activity with different communication style, different tasks set up, and a lot of times I can get the resistance to decrease. Does that all make sense? Is that helpful? Um, I know that this is a big topic and I can't necessarily address every single specific cause of resistance, but it's something where if you take a little bit of time and think about your family member and really think about what are times where they do engage versus what are times when they don't and what are the differences in those two environments. That's gonna help us figure out why the resistance is happening. Okay. So now we wanna take some time and have you apply all this 
so that something useful. So if you take your single sheet of paper and on the side that gives you a few questions with some blank space, um, you can work with each other, you can just work alone, whatever you're comfortable with. I want you to try to identify an activity for your family member. Please list the reasons why you chose that particular activity. So again, I want it to be specific to your family member and something meaningful. And then you're going to list strategies to simplify the activity, strategies to simplify the environment, and different communication strategies you're going to use to promote it. Any questions about what we're going to do? A lot of this is all visual. Visual. A lot of this is all visual. As, as oh, as examples that I'm using. Yes. yes. Okay, great, great point. So a lot of the examples of activities I've used involve people who require adequate vision. It's a great point. So when we think about somebody who doesn't have um, the same visual skills as you or I, we want to think about how can they engage in a different way. So even something like a sorting activity Yes, there's some vision required to, to like put something in a space, but if we can set it up in a wide enough place, they might be able to engage tactily. So maybe we have different items in a box that feel really drastically different, and we're asking them to sort you know, um, pieces of felt or fabric from like a nut or bolt. Right? So something that's drastically different gives them that tactile input, still involving the cognition to think about sorting something. Um, Music is a really, really big activity that we can use. What are some other examples of things? I'm gonna go all the way back to our activity list. What else do you guys use that maybe doesn't involve vision? Does anybody have some examples? Say that again. So what are examples of activities that you might do with your family member that don't require significant vision? Dancing. Dancing especially if it's hand in hand with somebody. Um, again, kind of those like short stories on tape, mm -hmm. something like that. What else? Anybody else? So let's think about if we have an activity. So what's something that your husband used to really like to do for fun? Run and bike. Okay. I mean, he was a very, very physically much an active. Right, right, right. Okay. Very big on that. Um, so there are still ways to adapt physical activities with impaired vision, but it might be that that person requires a little bit more physical assistance to engage in that particular activity. Um, so it's not to say that being physically active, so taking like a brisk walk, might still be something that's appropriate, but maybe they need someone by their side to make sure that they're navigating appropriately or safe during their walk. Um, I, a treadmill? Visually, it, it depends. Um, I do have some clients where we've installed like a, a railing for the stairs, except on a flat surface that allows them to just kind of stand and do activities. So again, this, this has some vision component, but this might be something that your husband could do. We have all sorts of things on the wall for the person to look at. So different photographs, different pictures of things from their childhood. So again, that might not require as much of that depth perception, but then we just have a rail installed, so balance-wise, they can still hold it, and they can kind of walk along the wall, view all of these different things. I'm um, slightly more passive in nature. Um, I'm trying to think. Does anyone else have any ideas? I'm gonna brainstorm more with you. But yeah, it's, it's very true. It's hard when we have somebody who um, has a different change in physical abilities, and we have to figure out how we can adapt it. Um, I have one client who is legally blind. We do a lot of storytelling. Um, she loves different short stories, but the caregiver who's in the home kind of reads those different short stories to her. Um, she does a lot of laundry, so again, might not be as relevant to your husband. But this particular woman um, visually wasn't able to see the laundry, but in terms of feeling like a towel or a washcloth, that was still something that was doable for her. Um, again, purpose, process, not product. So it's okay if they weren't folded well. Um, we could even do like feeling wise, you could sort different types of clothes. So socks from towels, socks from shirts, because that's something you could feel with your hands and be able to sort. 
I'll keep thinking. Yeah. I was going to say, like, I don't know if it looks like they would have, um, we have, like, the soft weights, like, we got the Target or something, but yeah. they're, like, squishy, and they're hand weights, and they're brightly colored. My mom likes to, you know, lift weights, and she Great. squats and lift weights with me, because she just likes that's to That's wonderful. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that's a great idea. So having different weights, doing squats with the weights, holding weights, wonderful. Any other thoughts? All right, I'll let you guys write a few things down, but I would love um, for all of you, well, not doesn't have to be all of you, some of you to share your thoughts and activity adaptations, if you don't mind. I'll give you a few minutes to write first. <clears throat> You can all continue to work, but does anybody who's finished feel comfortable sharing? Thank you. My husband has put together over a lifetime more than 12 picture albums. He's the person who puts the pictures in the album. Okay, great. And I've said to him many times, why don't you take out a picture album and look at it? I'm not going to do that anymore. Okay, great. Thank you. So I'm going to take out one album, okay. sit down with him in a comfortable place, look at the pictures. I'll make sure the lighting is good, which isn't a problem because yeah. I always make the lighting good. Perfect. I will sit at the most comfortable place, the dining room table, with me a comfortable chair. Great. <clears throat> now, for strategies, I'll ask him questions. I don't think I should. I have a question here myself. Whether I should tell, ask him with the, the names of the people. He doesn't even know our children, our grandchildren. Our children, he's okay. He doesn't even know the names of our grandchildren. So I will tell him the names of the people. I think I should do that. I okay. think that's a great idea. I will reminisce with him. That's easy with picture album. Great. And that's what I. That's what I choose. To I do. think that's mm -hmm. wonderful. That is perfect. And I think that comes up a lot. Um, you know, should I ask the person what the, na what the names of the people in this picture are? I usually default to no. If it's gonna cause any sort of stress or frustration or make the person anxious, our goal during this particular activity is for them to find enjoyment and meaning. It's not to try to enhance their ability to remember names, right? So if that's our goal, we're gonna do that at a different time. Um, for me, 
exactly what you just said is the purpose. We're trying to enjoy this activity. If he has trouble with names, we're just going to give him the cue. Bless you. So we're going to say, this is our grandson so-and-so. You know, we're going to name them for him. I think that's perfect. Thank he you also, so much. He also has a collection. I didn't think of that. He yeah. has a collection of political campaign buttons. Okay. In fact, he said he was going to sell them, and our kids were hysterical. Right. How can you do that? <laughs> I'm sure. So, I mean, he's got Woodrow Wilson. Yeah. He's got, no, wow. he's got wow. Rose, He's got Je uh, Teddy Roosevelt. I mean, he's oh, got, my gosh. And also wow. local people, local candidates. Absolutely. So, I hadn't thought about this before, yeah. but I may, he's got them very organized, and uh, I should take out their trays, they're in shallow trays, with loose sight on top so you can see them. I think I'm going to do that with him too, the same I way. I love that. I think that's, that's perfect. Cool. And he can tell me about the candidate, what he remembers. Absolutely. So, okay. I love good. it. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Love it. Then I can take some of these ideas for some of my clients too. So creative, I think that's perfect. And it's capitalizing on something that's been important to him. It's his collection. It was clearly meaningful to him at one point in time. So that's a perfect activity. Love it. Thank you. Anybody else willing to share? Yeah. I chose walking. Okay, great. Um, just to get him out of the house away from watching so much television. Okay. Mm -hmm. He enjoys it. And okay. You know, it gives me a good break. But, uh, and I have been doing this, so I'm trying to get him to walk two miles uh, four times a week. Um, and the reason for that is because he was faltering with his walking. He was unsteady, so okay. he was in physical therapy and then for two months. And he, he was doing fine, but then you know, just coming home and sitting and not doing anything again. Yeah. Um, yep. Anyway, that's the pressure of doing good. And the strategy is to simplify the activity was to only walk one way and then maybe have lunch or coffee or something and then take the bus back. That's a um, great way of simplifying it. Great. Mm -hmm. And uh, the strategy, strategy is to simplify the environment, walk only in good weather. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and he needs to be in a good mood. I don't know how to get that, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and give him ample time to get ready so that I'm not rushing him like I'm standing at the door. Are you ready yet? You know, I can't be doing that. I have to give him plenty of time. And I try to do that. I think that's and, great. Uh, and the strategies to enhance the engagement is if he wants to go to Florida, he's got to be able to walk. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. I did that with my husband for traveling and said, so you have to do this or you, you can't, you won't be able to travel and it's, it's a great motivator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for those, those people who still kind of understand that cause and effect, I think that's a great point. Not everyone's going to understand that connection of mm -hmm. if I do this, I will get this, mm -hmm. kind of that like reward system because that's mm -hmm. kind of some sequencing people kind of that goal directed that I was talking about have to be goal directed to be able to engage in a task to achieve a goal. For people who are not goal directed and who fall more into like that manual actions, unfortunately something like that might not be motivating because they just can't make that connection. But otherwise I think that's a really great point. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So I have uh, prepare fresh green beans for steaming. Okay, um, great. Because my husband loved to cook, always did the cooking, and he still has really great fine motor skills. Perfect. And uh, simplifying the activity is uh, putting, getting it all set up. The beans are on the counter. Your scissors, rather than a knife, scissors Perfect. to trim the ends. Perfect. And a colander. And um, to uh, maybe have <coughs> simplifying the environment is to clear the counter, have no extra bins, just the mm -hmm. colander. Perfect. And, and um, lots of light. And of course, green beans are a good contrast to our counter Perfect. anyway, in terms of light. Um, and maybe have two pairs of scissors so that we can we stand side by side with each other and do it. Great. Uh, or maybe me cut off the ends and then hand the bean already prepped to him and he can cut it into segments. Perfect. So that's another. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. That's great. It's tactile. Uh, exactly. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. The tactile, tactile activity. That's wonderful. And I think the other huge benefit to you being there to do part of it is that demonstration. 
right? So he gets to watch you do it, and that's going to be easier for him to be able to know what to do, too. Yeah. Perfect. Well, and then the other thing is when we eat them later, yeah. you know, make a big deal about, yeah. you know, thanks to you, we have green beans right. tonight. Yeah, um, that's great. And I, I think that's a really good point. I mentioned this kind of very briefly today, but any time I can set something up as you would be doing me such a favor, you're really going to help me. Mm -hmm. Anytime I can make that person feel as if they're contributing, they're helping me out, definitely is going to make the whole process a little bit more successful. So I think that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, basically the same thing. My husband loved to cook and did the same thing for, he was going to cut carrots, think of the carrots there, that's fine. But, and one veggie at a time, I can make it. But while we're doing it, we're doing this. We got wonderful dinner parties, we dress our own oh. And that's what he truly loves to do. Great. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's the motive. That's great. Right, right, right. Carrots are secondary. The reminiscing is really the main. That's perfect. Great example. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, this is completely adapting something. My That's husband okay. was a real outdoorsman, and he was a hunter. And fortunately, he said to me, I won't be doing any more hunting because guns, I don't think, are a good idea <laughs> at this point. That's a good call. And so, um, <laughs> uh, so we, I live in New Jersey. Okay. So we go to Atsai and Park. Okay. And it's really <coughs> rustic. I mean, after a certain point, you can't even drive anywhere. And yeah. so we get out and we look at the sky and we talk about, you know, there's a lot of deer, we have turkeys in my yard, etc. So we, you know, talk about the animals and how much fun he had when he went bear hunting or whatever. And so I mean, that's a big adaptation, but he's happy with it because he loves being outdoors. Perfect. And um, he knows, he, he's not so far along that he knows he can't hunt. He does yeah. know he can't hunt. Right, right. But it gives him that same feeling, like particularly when it's like cool out because you do pheasant hunting in the fall and the winter. Right. And those yeah. type of things. Um, and um, to simplify the activity, I often um, just reach out my hand because he's very much, it's not tactile, yeah. but there's something about me. That's comforting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. And then um, I encourage him about everything. I mean, the littlest thing, I yeah. tell him what a great job. And if I think he's tired, there's a 20 year yeah. age difference too. Okay, okay. <laughs> so if I think he's tired, I say, you know, I'm feeling kind of tired, I want to go home. Yeah. And he'll say, well, I don't feel tired. I'm like, yeah, I do. Right, right. You know, that you would be doing me a favor <laughs> if we go home. Right. Um, and so that's, I mean, that's a big adaptation, but it right. makes him happy. That's okay, I think that's great. And drastic adaptations are okay because you're still taking components of something that's meaningful to him and you've adapted it in a way that still allows him to feel comfortable, successful. It's not setting him up for something that's too complex. So I think that's perfect. Thank you. That's great too. Thank you. You guys are giving me such good ideas. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember. That's okay. Um, it happens to me all the time. Um, I would really love to have activities where I can sit down, I can sit him down and say, here, so I can, so so he's not just sitting there, he's not just right. napping. If he, right. if he isn't engaged, he's sleeping, and he, I feel he sleeps too much. Right, right. So where, where there would be an activity where he could engage himself, where I could suggest something. He does help, he does do household, some household chores. When okay. he remembers, when I Great. remind him. Or right. some occasionally on his own, which okay. I, is thrilling. That's really but, wonderful. Um, right. I was just wondering if there's yeah, a, a, such a list of things to somewhere I could say, here, yeah. do this. I wish I, I could just, say that it could be just kind of like a list and, and have it just happen. But I think if you already know that he does do household tasks, sometimes he needs a little bit of initiation, but generally he can do those household tasks, then that might be your list. 
So it's your list and you might end up initiating it, but you might say to him, instead of waiting for him to do it or waiting until you have a task that has to be done, you're gonna reframe it as this is activity engagement. And so therefore you might set that up for him on a regular basis. I have families that have the same pile of extra laundry that gets folded and refolded every single day. It's okay if you do that. You're not doing anything wrong by having just that pile of laundry where the whole goal of that pile is for activity engagement. It's just a pile. Oh, we're taking out the trash three times a day. Right. Okay. Oh, yeah. Totally yeah. fine with me. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Whatever is going to work. Great question, though. I know we are a little past 7.30, so I want to make sure I can let those of you go who need to go. I will stick around for a few minutes if any of you have last-minute questions.